good gunshot is multiple syllables and kind of a slap and a repeat. Best gunshots always have two syllables, I think. That's one of the big mistakes people make today. They use one syllable gunshots. <laughs> A gunshot can just be a pop or a click, depending on where you record it, because it's just a sudden, very brief, uh, loud noise, like a hand clap. The actual Indiana Jones gunshot was a 3030 Winchester rifle that was recorded. We did a lot of different gunshots. We probably recorded, you know, a few hundred different guns in different locations. The Indiana Jones gunshot wasn't, you know, processed or really manufactured in any way in the studio. It was pretty, it was pretty much exactly as it is in the live recording we did. We knew that Indy had a whip, and of course we could have pulled the whip sounds from a library since obviously there's been whips recorded in the past, but no, we wanted to do it ourselves. Actually, what happened was that Gary Summers, who was recording sound effects with me, spent the day on the set, and uh, the result of that was that Harrison had some time and came over to our editing room, and Gary and Harrison stood out back in the parking lot, and Harrison tried to show Gary how to crack the whip. It was a little too noisy to record it, so later I took Gary Summers out to quiet locations, and uh, Gary did a lot of cracking of the whip, and we did it in different environments, in the trees, uh, out in the middle of the field, and we built up a library of whip cracks, uh, which was the basis for Indy's sound. <laughs> the giant boulder was a tricky sound to invent because it had to have weight, but it also had to accelerate and move very fast, and finding something that big and getting it to move fast was hard. We had uh, several different sessions where we went out and tried to stage a boulder sound, and they were not successful. But on one of the last days, we were coming back from the location, and we were on a steep hill, and we were in this little Honda Civic station wagon on a gravel road on this mountain, and we were just coasting down the hill without the motor running. And we realized that the car sounded really interesting. Well, we might have the sound here. So I hung out the back and put a microphone near the back tire of the station wagon, and we just coasted down this road. And as the car accelerated, it gave a sense of gathering speed, and it, uh, that ended up being really the basis for the giant boulder. The body blows and punches in the Indiana Jones films was another area that we worked hard and tried to come up with uh, a new sound. Uh, although many of the sounds really, I think, were based on what we had heard in older films, the classic sound effects, but I wanted to remake them and do them in stereo and to exaggerate them probably in, in some ways because everything about Indiana Jones was somewhat of a comic book. We got a lot of baseball gloves, like catcher's mitts, and leather jackets, and some football equipment. And what we would do is, like, for instance, if you took a baseball bat, threw a uh, catcher's mitt in the air, and then hit it with the baseball bat as hard as you could, you would get a good whack, you know. <laughs> One of my favorites, you take a croquet ball, and you put it in a sock, so that you have kind of a nunchuck sort of weapon. <laughs> and you beat the pumpkin to death. Every so often, one of those hits out of the five or so is really good. And so a library was built up of those kinds of things. There were a lot of elements that went into the well of the souls. Uh, most principally were, uh, was the snakes. And uh, we started out uh, recording some real snakes, but snakes don't really vocalize all that much. And uh, part of the element of the snakes is really their movement over each other. And uh, we've had a lot of luck over the years with cheese casserole. Um, my wife makes a cheese casserole, and when it's in the dish and you just run your fingers through it, it gives a real oily, mushy sound. And if you record that and build it up in several layers, you can make a nice sense of slimy snakes moving around the room. That was augmented with some wet sponges being moved around. In fact, I think it was on top of a skateboard on the rubber place on top of the skateboard where you stand. Certainly the most supernatural part of the film was the end sequence where they open the ark and the spirits flow out and destroy everyone. 
So quite a bit of sound went into that. It's obviously the kind of sequence where there's nothing to record on the set at all. It's all going to be manufactured later. One, two, three, four. And uh, the sequence begins uh, with the uh, lid being slid off the arc. And uh, I experimented with a few different things. But I found that sliding the toilet tank cover in my own home toilet was perfectly sufficient. And uh, if I recorded that in an echoey bathroom, it seemed to fit although in a rather undignified way, the character of the arc itself. The arc itself, the humming, the, the uh, deep undulating tones that went with it, uh, were generated by a synthesizer. It's rare that I use an electronic synthesizer, but this was one case where I found uh, the kind of sound I wanted. I had an old ARP 2600, which is what I used to do R2-D2 and by reprogramming it, I was able to produce some wavering, low-frequency tones, which became the basic sound. Once the uh, arc is opened and the spirits start flowing around, um, there's quite a bit of work there taking animal screams and some human vocalizations, uh, as well as dolphin cries, which we had recorded, and sea lions. And uh, I ran those through a vocoder, which keeps a sense of the original sound, but adds a musical tone that follows the same pattern as the voice. So it gave it an otherworldly quality. All the sparking and beams were from a set of recordings I made of the old gear that was used in the Frankenstein movies. It was a fabulous variety of electronic devices and lightning generators and things of that sort. And out of that came all the sounds for the beams and things. The funniest story is the time my partner Richard Anderson lit himself on fire. And we affectionately refer to that recording as the incredible burning man. We were recording sound effects for Raiders of the Lost Ark and there's a sequence when someone lights the whiskey on fire and it travels down the bar and Richard and I wanted fire sounds for that. So like two complete rubes, we created a fire inside a recording studio, a patently bad idea. I'm stirring a can of Sterno, Richard is shooting benzene into it, and the fire, just like in the movie actually, the fire travels up the stream of benzene. The can Richard is holding in his hand ignites, it explodes and benzene goes all over Richard, and he's a man on fire. But in true field recordist fashion, he didn't say a word while he was on fire because he knew we were rolling tape the whole time and uh, ran about the room like a chicken with its head cut off until our partner Steve put him out with a fire extinguisher. I got a chance to work at the beginning of Skywalker Sound with the father of Skywalker Sound, Ben Burt. And uh, I remember the first time I was really flipped and so impressed by something Ben did with Raiders. The Hovito's on here. <laughs> Poison is still fresh, three days. All of a sudden, there is a strange, otherworldly creature, almost a Star Wars creature. I don't know where he got it. And it made that entire jungle scene so friggin' alien. And when I first heard that, I said, this is gonna be a great adventure. It's gonna be a great adventure in sound. 